try to figure this one out. Yeah. Let's see now. <clears throat> How does that sound? Good. Um, I, I uh, have had absolutely no prompting as to what this is going to be about. Well, Gary's going to be here soon, and he'll uh, he'll lead the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure it's going to work out just as well. Um, no worries at all. Um, that's the attitude to take in life, don't you think? There you go. Nice and fresh. This will be for Gary. Oh, <laughs> your very good health. <laughs> I'm going to take that picture off the screen. Oh, <laughs> your element. I just, uh, I just uh, uh, finished uh, doing this. Uh, <clears throat> Business that's sitting at a desk, uh, at the counter, or whatever, <coughs> signing books and so on to uh, all sorts of uh, just darling people who said all kinds of sweet stuff. And uh, <coughs> it was, uh, it was, it's just, it's marvelous. I there's some, uh, there's something about, I don't know what it is about uh, cartoonists and um, people who are into cartooning. Um, but there's a there's a funny uh, sort of uh, I don't know gentleness about them, which um, is <clears throat> markedly lacking in an awful lot of uh, <coughs> other branches of the arts. Uh, I think probably the most disputious and uh, cranky crowd are probably poets. <laughs> I've never been able to figure out why, except that I think the overlap between uh, the poets and the um, academics may be part of it. Because uh, mostly poets, in order to survive, uh, become teachers. And uh, they get into the, uh, the college world. Uh, and it's a strange world. I, it's, uh, I uh, remember, I got a lot of friends who are in it, dear friends, and uh, I remember <clears throat> the first time I was going to visit one of them, and they was in some huge college down south, and I was on a trip that would take me by it, so I, I, was, I went to see it, and I was quite, I was really thrilled because I was thinking in terms of uh, Plato and the Greek state and so on, and all these brilliant cultured people, learned types, and how they would exchange their wisdom and uh, share their different areas of knowledge. And you know, I had this notion of you'd go to the science area, wherever that was, and the fellow who taught astronomy would, you know, eagerly lead you to his telescope and point out the different planets and whatnot. And uh, as you'd go to their political people and they do the same. It would be, you know, just have wonderful interchange and they turn out to be completely different. Uh, the, each one of these crowds stays isolated from the other one almost universally. Why, I don't know. I can't imagine. And uh, they don't share. They don't communicate. Um, and they're, they're very crotchety. And... Uh, they form all kinds of stuff down to, um, I think, the most pathetic. And I noticed that more than one institution of higher learning, the cafeteria and where the, the tables and the seating at the tables is, is, a, is, a, is a subject of considerable wrath and uh, concern. Really is. I mean, these are brilliant people, uh, terrifically informed. It's very uh, discouraging about wisdom and so on. It is, don't know what to say. <laughs> High um, school writ large. Yes, yeah, there you go. Or mid school, uh, even that sort of. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but but uh, I don't. Cartoonists are. There's this like we like they take a little the bunch in uh, the New Yorker. Uh, we we turn up and uh, they're you know these are formidable characters uh, and. Uh, they could, if they wish, turn on you and slice you to pieces with uh, devastating jokes and, uh, you know, crush you. 
or the Oscar Wilde kind of, you know, things which are making me weep and flee the room. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're just these sort of, they're, they're, uh, I don't know that there's, there's actually no violence in them. They're, uh, they're very perceptive. Uh, they're, they spot um, the negative very clearly and are not unaware that the world is a, is a pro problematical sort of outfit and life is uh, full of great tragedies and so on, but it doesn't seem to really phase them, I, uh, uh, myself included. I mean, I sort of almost relish it. Uh, you know, life is, you know, life is a tragedy, and yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got an idea. I, uh, this guy's what? jumps out of a window, see, and it goes out from there. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 really, I really don't know. Uh, but it's nice, they're nice. And I, I always, like when I, we, we arrived here, and there were these people, yourselves and the rest of us here, who are gathered, and milling around, and uh, I don't know, they're just sort of, I, I said comfy is maybe in, almost in, I think it just, I, I felt comfortable. I thought, gee, yeah, here I am, and there's these nice people. Um, I, I really, there's a mystery to me, but it's, 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 uh, it's a pleasant one, and, 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 um, and it's, I don't know what it is, it's very positive because uh, I, I think the, um, the one of the things about humor is, is that it uh, does uh, have really uh, a kind of, a, it's a hard look at, uh, at life, uh, it's uh, it uh, points out uh, some devast it seeds devastating stuff. It's it's the, it's the grist for their mill. It's, it's uh, what, uh, what it, it, it's a reaction to disaster, to uh, futility, to uh, hopelessness. Uh, positive one, it's extraordinary when you think about it. Uh, and you come, and, and, and also it, it, it will toy with philosophy. And I mean, I, suppose, I guess I think probably I, of all humorists uh, that I've run into, I think maybe Mark Twain was as as, as a, in his life as he went on consistently throughout his life. Uh, just he was just an endless uh, source of incredible. Uh, Line, one liners uh, in his in his writing and and uh, just in, in interviews and uh, those things which were overheard and reported, just amazing things. I like I think of all of his uh, of his lines that uh, was my my very favorite was concerned uh, mortality uh, and uh, it was somebody had ran into a reporter, I suppose, and uh, they <coughs> they said to, to Twain, so we, we understand, Mr. Twain, that uh, uh, you, uh, you have, you, you, you're, you're sort of very, uh, you're, you're sort of dismissive of, of a lot of uh, claims of, of religion and uh, uh, the afterlife and such things and uh, uh, how do you handle that? I mean, aren't you? Uh, don't you have? Uh, I mean, the fear of death. Uh, that, that doesn't that loom over you? I mean, and Twain. <coughs> I will do a sort of Twainian. He he said, um, fear of death. Is <laughs> <coughs> I was dead for millions and millions of years. <laughs> Before I was born, <laughs> and it never uh, bothered me in the least. <laughs> I mean, you can't top that. It is really odd. It's, it's a, um, you're talking, I mean, it's just devastating. At the same time, it couldn't be sweeter and more kindly. Uh, and I guess, and that's part of this this whole thing with him, with you.
to understand it. Um, I think probably, rather than rattling on, uh, it, I noticed the, the last speaker was asking for questions, and probably we should just, just start with questions. Uh, anything you want to know, I'll tell you. Yes. Actually, just a comment. Didn't you meet up Mark Twain by being born dead? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's yeah, born dead. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that that uh, born dead uh, is. Uh, I was born dead. It was, was a, uh, a very quite interesting, uh, very dramatic story. I love it. Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my uh, my mother was given something, uh, some uh, knockout gas that they call twilight sleep. Twilight sleep was given to her. And uh, it had the unfortunate effect of uh, killing me. Uh, and I came out um, blue and unbreathing. And they, they put me uh, aside on a table, uh, just, you know, plonk, and uh, we're tidying up. And uh, fortunately, the, the family doctor, regular GP, happened to be peering through a little porthole looking into this uh, operating room. He saw this thing and he burst into the place <coughs> and he rushed over to me and he lifted me up like that and he splashed me in some hot water and then he splashed me in cold water and went pap, pap, pap like that. And I started to cry. He brought me to life. Uh, so I was, I was dead and uh, I would have remained so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's uh, yeah. That, 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 that I'm sure that it, I'm I'm positive uh, that little taste of death uh, lingered on. I mean, I don't know where you go when you die, but I was there. Uh, isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that creepy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, yes. Well, this is probably a common question, but uh, is anyone besides Charles Adams that really? Turned your prank, our wives? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Charlie was—he uh, certainly was a huge influence. I just—he uh, was very uh, a nice, co complicated guy, uh, and uh, a very sweet guy. And um, as and he had a huge influence on me as, as a kid. I, I very, very, very profoundly bent me. Um, <laughs> And the first, uh, actually, the, the, the first cartoonist who really did it to me, and I can remember the uh, experience. I can remember being physically, I can, I can call it back, I'm on a carpet in the living room, and I'm this little person, very little person. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, the comic pages of the Chicago Tribune uh, open on the carpet next to me. And I am looking at Dick Tracy. And uh, I had loved Dick Tracy, and, but just as a, as a reader, as a fan, but I suddenly it occurred to me, wouldn't it be fun to do that, to, to, to do Dick Tracy? Uh, and uh, that, was, that was when I, it, that's when it happened. That's when I thought, yeah, damn it, that's what I was, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And, 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 and uh, the guy who wrote the stuff uh, and drew it was Chester Gould. And, um, Chester Gould was a, uh, he had been with the Tribune for a very long stretch uh, prior to uh, the Dick Tracy business. And uh, he had been, uh, done a whole bunch of various things. Uh, he's, he'd done in the art department, been gone on from there, but he'd, he did, he did uh, in the beginning, these maps of crime scenes, and they'd have, um, you know, this little, you've seen them, they, I don't, they don't do them as much as they used to, but they'd have this little inner, you know, here's this corner of so and so, and so and so, and then have a little X. Blood stains here, a trail of blood leading down alley, uh, corpse found here, uh, sort of thing. And uh, um, this, they, he, the, the people at the Tribune were, um, he got to be chummy with some of the, the, the biggies. 
and they they get the, uh, they this, this one leader uh, got this notion of uh, let's how about a detective story comic strip, and uh, that's how it all started. And he said, well, okay, I'll try it. And he he did it, and the stuff that he did it was not it was not like Warren I, Warren Beatty's movie of Dick Tracy was was amusing and interesting I thought and uh, visually quite quite cute I mean I caught this the color the sort of stark comic book colors and so on but they they soft peddled it they 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 completely missed the goriness of, of, of Dick Tracy um, he had not the the, the villains in Dick Tracy were very villainous, and they were t they were horribly disfigured too. Another subtlety about uh, Goldblum was that you'd have these incredibly disfigured, whew, like prune face, or it was just a mass of wrinkles and various. They were just, but and he, and they were drawn rather crudely. Uh, his drawing style. Was as, as some one one person once noticed uh, told me he was right absolutely right it was like a blueprint everything was very clear and sort of flat like a blueprint is and it had blueprinty the point of view was very blueprinty uh, it would move around to show you clearly what the thing was and he would have like little instructions like uh, Dick Tracy had a wrist radio and every so often he'd go like this to talk to headquarters, and whenever he did, a little arrow would appear and say, wrist radio. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, but, but these, these poor villains, he, it, 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 it took me a while to realize, it, 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 it dawned on me that these two scratchy funny things, he would get all kinds of really subtle expressions in Prune Face's face. I mean, Sorrow, anger, uh, thoughtfulness, he'd do it, he'd, he'd get it across. Uh, and if, if one of these guys got shot, he wouldn't just be shot. Uh, the bullet would stay there and it would superate. The whole, uh, the, he'd get pus, you know, and he'd die slowly and horribly. And uh, there's, there's really grim, grim stuff. Uh, remember the one wonderful one where they had the really creepy, where there was a house, one of the, uh, it, it was all located in Chicago, very clearly. And uh, this one thing took place in a Robert Barron's mansion on the near north side, you could tell. And uh, there, this little girl had vanished, and nobody knew where she had gone. And uh, her, her little uh, uh, sister went down, was, was puzzled and worried, and she went down in the basement to get some ice cream from the, this enormous freezer. And she opened the thing up, and uh, you saw it says, uh, this little arrow came up. He said, "Dead body, <laughs> my sister." <laughs> and sure enough, there it was. Uh, <laughs> uh, that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, yeah, Dick Tracy. He was. I would. I would put. I would say that Chester Gould was was probably my major initial influence for sure. Um, and I eventually worked uh, in the Chicago Tribune briefly because we had a wonderful uh, thing where the guy who was the editor <coughs> of the Chicago Tribune, a guy named Don Maxwell, and he lived uh, in, in the apartment above my parents' apartment, which was on the near north side. And um, um, he went, so we, we got to, to be good, really good friends because what happened was uh, I had, uh, when, when I was so early teens, or getting up, you know, 14 ish, like that, and I got involved in radio. First with high school, I had a chum, and the two of us uh, got into the school of radio thing. And uh, we eventually went on, to, I uh, in, got deeper into it, and uh, he eventually became a, a producer. And he was uh, he was he produced the first of the uh, Oprah Winfrey show, so he did quite well in that area. Uh, I've wafted away into cartooning and so on, <laughs> uh, but um, it was um, was it was uh, the. I, I, I uh, was had uh, this 
wire recorders. This was before tape recorders. And uh, Maxwell uh, uh, was, we were chatting, and, I, and I, it came up in the conversation. And uh, he had me demonstrate it, and he was thrilled. Uh, and I, it put, what he did, he, in, in this uh, his apartment, he would, every weekend, uh, uh, Friday it was, he would have this, uh, a party almost every weekend, every, every Friday. And it was, a, 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 he would have these people come at, to the party, and they would be, uh, he being the editor of the Tribune, amazingly important people. I mean, senators and governors and God knows what, all kinds of people that were terribly, terribly impressive. And uh, they would, uh, uh, what would happen? He would get them drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'd manipulate them. He was uh, quite a son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was his, his joy, was to get these you know, famous people just have them go for each other <laughs> and maneuver them. Uh, and uh, so, he, when he saw this tape recorder, he 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 said, he said, you've got, I said, no, I tell you, what, oh, you've got to come up, Dan. I got to, you you've got to come up to the next party, Dan. So what he did was he uh, had me sit there at a table with this recorder, and uh, he would uh, start getting these people soused. And uh, it was, I must say, this, I, this may also be part of what made me a cobbler cartoonist, but uh, I got, at, a very, at an early age, uh, I saw the world's, the, the leaders of our little world, and some of them were world leaders, uh, uh, revealing themselves to be idiots. <laughs> uh, and it was quite discouraging, it still is. <laughs> and uh, it also taught me to uh, observe, have an eye for clues that, uh, oh, well, this, this prime minister is a fool. Because <laughs> I've suggested just like that guy behaved, or that, that governor, or that mayor, or whatever. And uh, I, would, I, would ta I, would, I would tape the, uh, he, I'd hang around and he'd be taping, and, then, and as they got drunker and drunker, it would continue, and uh, then he would start the next party with the record of the, that I made of the prior party. And they'd all start going, ha, 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 like that. And then he'd have, them, he'd have me tape them. And so he had this, it was, it was, he'd sort of pile one on top of the other. Uh, so any, anyhow, anyhow uh, the, I ended up in the Tribune doing, of all things, what Chester uh, Gould did, uh, these little maps of uh, killed here, Tried to crawl a certain amount there. <laughs> Left eye fell out here. <laughs> um, so it was, a, it was a great, great maturing experience. Um, and, um, and and then there you go. I guess that's the answer to that question. <laughs> yes. How did you end up at Playboy? Um, sheer luck. Absolute sheer luck. Uh, one, one of the things that I have uh, I've found is that uh, uh, <coughs> luck is in, as far as art is concerned, or certainly freelance versions of art, uh, luck is just tremendous. I mean, I, I've known all sorts of people who are, uh, were, some were unlucky and have died, uh, uh, who should have made it, and they didn't make it because they had lousy luck. Uh, and others who were just, just absolutely equal, and they they did fine because they had good luck. So luck is uh, luck is, is just 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 tremendous. Uh, and I had a, a a terrific lucky break. I there was a um, I had um, had some dealings with Harvey Kurtzman, who is of course the guy that made up Mad Magazine, and he was a brilliant brilliant. I don't know if any of you knew him, but he was. Uh, an amazing guy, and uh, he was uh, just, uh, he, was, he was a genius of, of his kind. He, just cre he created this whole satire thing and built it up and pulled in people, and uh, I was, uh, it was just, it was staggering. Uh, and then, then he, got into, he got into trouble because of the, uh, <coughs> uh, 
He, he was, uh, with MAD, the, the thing was run by a guy who was uh, a kind of despot and a little bit nuts. And uh, he finally decided to hell with this, I'm going to go off and make another magazine. And he did. He got, he got tied in with, um, there was a thing called Trump Magazine. And uh, it was a, um, uh, it, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a classy production of a mad type magazine. It was very well produced. It had good paper. It was uh, an extraordinary thing. Uh, and uh, I, I, when I saw it, uh, I thought, I have got to. Uh, uh, be part of this thing. I, I, at that point, I didn't know Harvey, and so um, I um, uh, called up. I, it, it was in, and I saw. I looked at the masthead, and I saw it was in Chicago. I had this. That was the address given. So um, I would visit my parents for Christmas every year in the, in Chicago, and um, so I called up this the number for Trump, and I said I'd like to. to uh, Make an appointment, I, and I bring a portfolio and show show my stuff and uh, and so on. And could I set then I set it up, and there it was, and fine and dandy. So I uh, I arrived uh, there. I was. I walked in. It was a, a brownstone, largish brownstone, and the inside, side. And uh, I went in, and I went to the receptionist, and I said, "I'm getting Wilson on here for an appointment." And uh, <coughs> The, the, the woman said, oh, yes, yes, we said, yes, yes, I see you're here. Yeah, all right, very good. <laughs> and I said, I'm here to uh, see uh, the uh, 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 Harvey Kurtzman, the editor of the Trump magazine. And she, she looked at me with an odd expression and said, well, Trump, Trump, Trump magazine's offices are in New York City. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and I was struck, I was just, you know, I was so absolutely like, Total idiot, and uh, I sort of no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this guy came up in back of me and said, uh, "Hello there, I'm Art Paul, and Hef would like to see you." <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know who or what a Hef was. <laughs> uh, and I, I, what the hell could I do? I said, "Sure." <laughs> And uh, he led me to this door, he opened the door, and there was this narrow staircase going up there into what seemed to be darkness. And so I went up the staircase, my little portfolio, and it was a darkened room. And there was just a couple of sources of light, and there was this thin man on the phone. And he looked up at me and, and pointed to a, a chair, and I, I, I sat down, and, and he said, well, I said, um, <coughs> so, well, it was we, we, uh, we got your article that you, uh, and, and uh, very good, it's a very good article. It's very well written. Very well written. Uh, but the problem is that uh, the uh, tone of it was uh, uh, anti-sin, and um, uh, we're, we're pro-sin. <laughs> And I thought, Jesus H. fucking Christ. <laughs> they went on with the conversation, said nice things to this man, sort of soothing him, and sort of <laughs> and, and, and very pleasant and kind of it. Got rid of it. And then he stood up and he reached up and he said, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> and that's how it got started. And, uh, I honest to God don't know why I didn't go there before because uh, he was, uh, Playboy was the first uh, general magazine to pay science fiction and, and fantasy writers a decent amount of money for a short story up until then. All the markets that bought that kind of stuff were pulps and whatnot. They didn't have any money at all. They gave me little dicky amounts. He would give them these fabulous things. So that's how I got in there. Total and absolute luck. Um, and it was a, it's been just a swell association. Uh, it couldn't be better. And uh, I'm just wonderful. Just absolutely fabulous. Had yeah. after seen your work before you walked in? Yeah, that was a, he, he'd been following it. I, I had, uh, at that point, I was selling uh, Conyers and Look 
magazine and a lot of other such publications long gone. And, uh, I managed, had managed to get odd cartoons out there. Uh, they were, you know, the sort of stuff you associate with what I do. <laughs> and so it's spooky stuff and odd stuff. And so uh, they, and, and Hector saw it and he, he dug it. He liked it. And uh, so what he did was, what happened then is that uh, he just, uh, I, all, all those all those two things, with the exception of, uh, they were all black and white, these, these other things, the look and so on. But uh, uh, Conyers had been, uh, <coughs> they were experimenting, so they had a little color in it. So I had had some with a little color, but it was very, very limited and they were, little dinky things, uh, so you couldn't really do a lot uh, in it. And with Hefner, there was this full page, and there was full color. And uh, so, um, once, and then another thing that happened simultaneously was uh, Hammer uh, Pictures were doing these marvelous uh, uh, horror movies from, from in England. And they were very, uh, on the outside of up until then, uh, most horror movies, with the exception of The Magnificent Mr. Whale, uh, with Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and so on, which were just gorgeous. And uh, he talked about huge influences. <laughs> I would not be standing here were it not for him. Uh, and uh, his, his version of uh, the monsters and the this is and the that is. Uh, but, uh, I, I, I took a, 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 a hint from them, and they had these lovely uh, productions, and they lovely sets, uh, beautifully photographed, and the atmosphere, and uh, so I said, yeah, well, I'll use this, and, and, and uh, it, it, it all came together, very, very, in a, in just super, another luck thing. Um, so there you go, luck again. Yeah. Uh, were there any cartoons that were hard to sell or that generated controversy? Uh, oh, a lot, a lot of them never did sell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, got, I've got, got some small cartoons I can show you. That, uh, this, no, it's, uh, you, 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 you just don't. The con uh, actually, um, yeah, there's, a, there's, uh, there's been at, at various points uh, cranky people saying cranky things about me, but um, very little of it, really. Um, uh, I've been quite fortunate in that respect, I think. Uh, I've been kindly treated, I, I really have to say. Uh, no complaints. Yes? How old were you when you sold your first cartoon, and do you remember what it was? Yeah, uh, I was uh, just, I was in the, the tw early 20s, thing, very early 20s. And, and uh, I would, it was, um, uh, I had been, I, my, my parents, bless their hearts, uh, they had their failings, but don't we all, uh, they had uh, uh, given me the okay to um, uh, be, be a mad cartoonist, and, and so I had gone to Greenwich Village, uh, and uh, because I had gone to the Art Institute of Chicago and had taken a fine arts course, I, I knew all a, a lot of people who had gone two grand shows who were painters. Most of the people I knew were painters, some of them legendary types. And so um, uh, he lived for very little money, amazingly little money there. That was the whole secret of that period, is you could get yourself a nice apartment and, uh, I mean, it's a crummy apartment, a horrible, terrible thing, but it was sufficient for the, it was a room that protected you. It didn't, you know, the rain didn't come on, beat it on. They left you alone. And uh, you, you got you, you could spend like fifty dollars a month would uh, be perfectly okay. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, that was. And the uh, the, 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 the where was it? What was I leading up to? I'm sorry. First cartoon you sold. First cartoon I sold. I went around making uh, just just enough with these weird little. Uh, I, I didn't. They, I, the first cartoon I did was I was being financed by my parents. They, they just gave me enough money to keep me going for, and the deal was three months. After that, you had to do it. On, and you were on your own. 
So I had those three months. And uh, I went around, went around. I wasn't selling anybody. And um, they were, um, and as I, as I told this another, what's prior, that point that <coughs> this, 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 this one guy, I remember when I loved him, he was, eventually did end up selling him. Ran with these men's magazines where they had lots of hunting and shooting and killing animals and things like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, and they also had the most interesting sort of cartoons. Uh, but I was getting, I was, he would, he would, he was, I, I love him. He had a cigar, he smoked a cigar, and uh, he's a very friendly guy. And he'd look at these things and go. <laughs> 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 He got a little second, then he square him up and say, eh, great, great cartoons, kid. But our, our readers wouldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, that's what I was getting. <clears throat> and uh, I went to this one thing, Ziff Davis. Uh, uh, when Ziff Davis was his outfit, <clears throat> and they published pulp magazines. Uh, and they, they, they had amazing stories and fantastic stories. And, uh, the covers of the things were uh, girls with big breasts and uh, being, uh, uh, look, being approached by tentacled monsters who for some reason, I don't know, you thought, what is he going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> These big breasts. I mean, uh, so, but they were, I loved those magazines. But, uh, so I thought, well, all right, they're far at least weird, you know, weird. Maybe I can sell them a cartoon. So I brought a batch, and they bought one, and that's the first cartoon, and uh, it was a damn good cartoon. It, it uh, had a, it was a show, the winter scene, uh, snow's coming down, and uh, uh, there's a, uh, in, the, in the background, you see it come walking towards the viewpoint of the, 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 the reader, is this man and his child, and the child is going like this, and he's pointing excitedly ahead. And then in the foreground, we, there's a, a little hillock of snow. There's this dead bird, and it's uh, a little peak like that. And his little claws are going like that. And the kid is saying, look, Daddy, look, the first robin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, the first cartoon. <laughs> Do you care to say anything about what's going to be in the uh, three volumes in at Gary's publishing center? Ah, uh, well, he had less his heart. Less his heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, it's a wonderful book. Wonderful book. <laughs> <laughs> I understand it'll bring good luck. Isn't that not true? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, he's, it, it is a, um, uh, this, his outfit, as, as uh, you, uh, the graphics, as you must know, uh, do uh, extraordinary. They they obviously they like cartoons. They respect cartoons, and they do these incredibly well produced books of cartoons. Uh, nothing like them ever before. And uh, this one is a uh, it's insanely uh, complicated thing because it is everything I've done for Playboy. Uh, include not just the cartoons, but short stories and articles and so on, all piled into three volumes. Uh, and if you want to, uh, if you want to purchase one of them, right there's the man to see right there. Uh, and uh, that it's it's I uh, can't wait till it comes out. Unfortunately, I uh, was here. Um, Timing was somehow off because I came here to plug the book, but the book was does not exist yet. But it will exist. It exists in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> it exists in Asia. I didn't realize. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah in, the, in the far mysterious Orient, this book exists. <laughs> like many other truths. Yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, talk about how you came to National Lampoon and uh, the Nut Strip, which was is that yeah. the only like, for instance, regular strip that you ever did? Because normally it was single panel cartoons. Yeah. That was more of a series. Is that the only one that you Yeah, did? that was, uh, the, the Lampoon was, a, 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 again, a, um, um, like, it was, it was a terrific experience. There was these crazy 
uh, people from uh, from Harvard, basically. Uh, nutty as fruitcakes, every one of them. And they decided, by God, they were just going to uh, make fun of everything and uh, tell the truth and just, just have fun. Just do it. And so the instruction was to be as, as just rough and tough as you could be and so on. And, we, and, and they encouraged you to, if it was uh, in bad taste, they'd try to egg you on so it would be worse taste. You know. And it was, it was just, I just loved every minute of it. And, uh, and they were brilliant. They were, we just, uh, it was just glorious. And uh, they eventually got the notion of, uh, so I was doing spreads, basically. They were, and they were color, and I could play around with it and do you know, just, ama just amazing things, uh, get away with it. Nobody would, would, would slow you down at all. Uh, so uh, they, were, they decided they'd have a thing called the comic pages and have a, the back part of the magazine would have these comic strips, which would be regular comic strips. And they, they wanted me to do one. And they said, you know, something really horrible. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Awful, you know, it's a terrible, the worst thing you can think of, you know? I mean, really, you know? And so uh, I, was, I started thinking, well, let's see, uh, decaying corpses, uh, vampires, Frankenstein monsters going wrong, uh, and so on and so on. What's the most horrible thing in that? And then none of them were sort of going, and then I thought, what is the most horrible kind of one? Being a little kid. <laughs> yeah. Thought, yeah, being a little kid, that is, that is horrible. That is horrible. And it gets these little, little kids are, I mean, they're, they are so sweet. There's a whole bunch of them crawling around here, you know, this, and then, <laughs> Uh, they're just, uh, they, they're, but they're so vulnerable, and, and uh, the uh, they, it, they're, and they're, the thing that I I never can understand this is, is to so many adults don't they seem to have forgotten entirely that that these little kids are much more there than they think they, they pretend they're, they they get sentimental about them and they're these little aren't they cute you know and. Uh, they're complicated, they're taking everything in, they're feeling it, they're scared shitless, uh, they're confused, they're baffled, uh, they're, they're distraining their minds trying to understand and comprehend something about why does this happen kind of stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing to see a little kid going through, it. it's, it's just day after day after day, this, this, uh, this mysterious, strange life that they're in. So that's what I did. That's, that's, that's how I got started. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your working process? Do you come up with everything from scratch and it's just like getting it down, or do you think and edit as yourself as you go along? Or? It's, it's, I do it, uh, uh, I, very professionally. I'll, I'll um, have some, well, for example, if I'm going to do a batch of cartoons for Playboy, it's a batch of cartoons for Playboy. and. Uh, it's, it's like, um, these magazines are all like, uh, I, I, my favorite comparison is it's like a party. So when you go to a party, uh, it's important to know the, who's throwing the party, what sort of people are at the party. And so you uh, go there dressed appropriately for the party. I mean, you, you, uh, and you, you behave uh, the way that you should in this party because that's the way the people of that party behave and so on. Uh, and that's the same thing with, so you get into the right mood. You think, you know, Playboy, and there's this whole set of stuff uh, which just goes clunk into place, and you work within that, that environment. It's, it's developed for that environment. It's a New Yorker, whole other thing, and so on and so on. And if I'm going to uh, do a, a, a book, uh, if it's a kid's book, I will, uh, I'm, I'm addressing these kids. I'm trying to uh, do something which is not just the kids, but also the publishers. <laughs> Bear in mind the publishers too. Uh, so it's all, it's all very calculated. Uh, and, and, you, and you do that. And then that's the, very, that's the first thing you do, is you, you make sure you're working in the right parameters. You've got the, your... your it's you what you're doing it's not a waste of time it's it's just the point of it is to do something good which they'll like this particular market and then you do it 
and it's, uh, and so it's uh, it's all very calculated, uh, and, uh, and 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 you do it. I mean, once you get into it, then you try it to make it as funny as possible. That's a whole other series of techniques where you've developed uh, how to be funny and also how to ang- how to reveal it, how to how to draw the drawings, uh, how to pace it, and so on. Yeah, well, there was somebody that was waiting. To, uh, yes. Um, well, obviously you have a, a recognizable style, but uh, do, you, do you experiment still with other styles, or do you have private pro- uh, projects? That uh, yeah, it, it's that the, the uh, uh, again the styles are are uh, are, are within the, the uh, within the market. I mean, Playboy is one effect. It's like it's like during a movie, it, 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 you're, you're shooting it. In effect, uh, you're going with this kind of. You have one kind of set for Playboy, another kind of set for The New Yorker, uh, and so on. And so, it, so it's uh, as far as the style is concerned, and the drawing. That's that's just I draw. I will draw. It, you draw it a little differently for The New Yorker and differently for Playboy. You definitely do, because they're both. It's they're, they're sort of two different world approaches, but uh, it's still. I mean, it, it, because it's you, it's consistently you. And uh, yeah, it's it's. But there's a, it's yeah. You just it's like crossing the street. You 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 check it out, see what the traffic's like, and uh, so on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering about working with the New Yorker. They had the famous one day a week where every cartoonist in New York would show up at the same time and, and yeah. submit the performance. Any anecdotes relating to interacting with the other cartoonists on that day, or how the yeah, well, there uh, as I was saying. Uh, Talking about the people here, uh, they they're that bunch. You'd love them. Uh, they're these sweet people, and uh, they're, uh, there's, uh, there's, they're just not unlike the poets. <laughs> there's no, there's no competition going on. Everybody likes everybody, and uh, but there's a, there, we're varied. I mean, like uh, Sam, Sam Gross is very, uh, he's one kind of guy and I'm another kind of guy and so on. We're all different, but uh, we're all cartoonists too, so it works out. <laughs> and the cute, I think, one thing I sometimes, what we do is after we've done the, the look business, you, can, you know, they all turn, we all turn up and, and one by one file in and show our stuff and then come back and off we go to lunch. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, Sometimes I look at them with great fondness, and it's sort of like I feel like they're Snow White's dwarves, uh, myself included. And as we go through this, you know, there we are in Times Square and all that stuff. Uh, they're just they're just uh, terrific, they're a great crowd, and uh, and very varied, uh, but they're all cartoonists, all humorists, and uh, what's them what's them all, everyone. Yes. Uh, what kind of tools do you use? Uh, <coughs> I uh, use a uh, Croquill pen uh, consistently, and I'm, I'll uh, in, in the ink, and, and then uh, I'll uh, do a drawing in you know line drawing business, and then I if it's a, a black and white thing, I'll just do work with a lap black, and. Uh, and, and, and uh, I have a little uh, mixer, well, these, these, these wonderful uh, plastic uh, things they've got now, which have got little sort of scoops in them, and, and you just you can set up a whole bunch of shades and different stuff like that, and go poop, poop, poop like that, and poop, poop, poop like that. It's very, very handy. Uh, and then if I'm doing a color thing, and then and then and I'll just do the whole thing with this. Uh, and, and, and black and white in, in the thing, and, that, and that's basically it. I might tone it a little bit with a little pencil rub here and there, or something like that. Um, and with Playboy, it's uh, they're very elaborate. I start out with a, again the croak wheel drawing, and then I fill it in with watercolor, same same little watercolor uh, kit, and uh, squeezing the stuff out of the little tubes, or I've got little things with a little dry. Uh, Thing you know, which is wet, you know, like that. And then, um, then when I get that all colored with the basic colors, I will spray it 
with a uh, uh, Krylon worker fixative, <coughs> and then just start over uh, under doing this underpainting thing and laying on other stuff. I'll uh, do pencil rub rub pencil and sort of like that, and shade it like that, or I'll use this. They've got this sort of uh, these pastels that are made out of grease. And you can woofle around with those too, and you just you do a certain amount, and then you s spray it so it's all fixed, and you do another layer, and uh, you can really get very rich tones and subtleties in that in that way, and that's how I do it. That's the way I do it. Yes. Uh, how much of your life's work would you say is in the three Playboy books? What percentage was? Uh, oh, geez, I, I I don't know because I've done. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is all, this is all the, 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 the various uh, other magazine stuff, then there's the various books that I've done. Also, there's this writing, which I did a whole lot of writing, and I then I went to the West Coast for a uh, movie stretch, and I, that, I stopped doing it, and, I, and didn't get really back into it. I intend to get back into it, uh, although I am now working on a... Uh, there's this uh, movie I'm very I, I'm hopeful about. I did a <coughs> book called Eddie Deco's Last Caper, which is a uh, was an interesting book. A time uh, New York Times uh, publisher brought it out. And it was a um, it's, it's it's a take. It's about the, the tough detective uh, sort of thing, and uh, it was done in a combination of. Uh, narration and illustration, and the illustration is part of the narration, uh, so that you will have uh, uh, they, you know, somebody or other had, you see, in the writing will say so and so walked into the room, and then you'll have a picture of this room with so and so point of view, and there'll be stuff in there which will not be ever mentioned in the narration, but it's there, and so you pick it up from there and you go on with the narration again. And then you go back to another visual thing, so it keeps bouncing back and forth, and it worked very, very well. Uh, and it um, is actually it ends up really what it is is a storyboard. It's the, it's the sort of thing you do for a movie, where you have a picture and you have the uh, script and the two things. It, that's really where I got it from. Uh, so we're. I don't know if I hope we do it. We, 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 with this, uh, we, we, this, this outfit called Stars up in Canada, and they have done some excellent animation, very, very good animation. And I, we just uh, had a, a couple of trips up there, extremely encouraging, and um, we'll 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 see what happens. Uh, one, I'm the, one of the wisest people I know in in movie making. Uh, once said, uh, the thing in this business you got to do is not hope. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's right. <clears throat> you just sort of do it and you don't hope because that's, you just don't bother with that, you know. But they're, they're very good. I'd love, one, the one thing about them that actually it was quite a, a revelation. I had worked with <coughs> Quite a few animation houses. I only there's only one one movie I did which worked, uh, which they let me do, which was with uh, <coughs> who the hell was it? Um, uh, with Mr. Goldman. I know I can't know if it's popular. One of the major studios, and it was a short, and it came out with uh, Buffy the Vampire, and uh, they had the idea of bringing back shorts, and it, w it did very well. It got uh, it was almost got an Academy Award, and uh, it uh, was uh, it was great fun, uh, but uh, the, um, the, the, the other experiences I had, and it was, there was this thing I did for Showtime, which was a great big uh, <coughs> uh, hour thing, and it was essentially based on nuts. And it was, uh, they, they, they completely screwed it up. I mean, and, and I got, I uh, had this agent which wouldn't back me, and they kept crudding up the story, and it's banal and trite and dumb. And uh, 
so on. But there was one, this, this one good one is called, uh, what the hell was it called? <laughs> uh, I forget. But it, it was, a, it was a, a, about a, 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 a diner, the diner, and it was um, really a, a hell of a good uh, short. And, and it was uh, just to just to take off on on diners, and, 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 and you had this diner which had very macabre stuff going. You saw it, so it's not in possible. Yeah, yeah. So that one that one worked, and uh, we'll see if this one works. I, look, I love I love animation, and uh, I'd love to do that. So yeah. Yeah, I, I was curious. Uh, there was a story you mentioned earlier about the editor who said his readers wouldn't get your humor. Yeah. I'm wondering, over the last 40 or 50 years, if you've experienced that more with editors, I'm wondering, has there been a change in the level of, uh, of what editors can understand as far as the verbal part of the humor? Well, I think that uh, <clears throat> it certainly has become much uh, more sophisticated and... Uh, Cartooning, uh, you are you are now given. Uh, you know, there's less and less outlets. Uh, I think I think to be quite honest that the magazine cartoon business may become extinct uh, because the, uh, uh, the the essential policy of almost every magazine for a long time was that they just automatically had cartoons. Uh, and that's not the policy anymore. They just don't do it. So we may follow in the footsteps of uh, magazine illustrators, which used to be a, a quite a sizable um, field of enterprise, and now is almost entirely non-existent. Uh, so, that, which is another reason why I'm doing all kinds of other stuff. You feel that's one thing you have to do. The things change. That's all it is. Through. But, but as far as the uh, level of sophistication and tolerance and what the hell is triad is concerned, it's much better. That, that aspect of it is much better. And so it's a kind of compensation. I think you can you can get away with stuff now that you certainly could not have gotten away with back then. Very definitely. Absolutely. I, I have no idea what time am I exceeding the time or are we about to uh, we um we have, we have just a few minutes left, and um, even though I'm sure you don't want to hear from anyone, Gary Wilson standing here, on, and I'll, I'll, I'll let him have the last word. I did. I did want to um, plug our books one last time, and that's books plural. We have the 50 Years of Playboy Cartoons uh, that's coming out in about six weeks, and they have uh, introductions by Neil Gaiman and Hugh Hefner and uh, a long, meaty interview with Gayon and a biography of Gayon. And we're also publishing the Complete Nuts strip, which has never been, yeah, never been published in its entirety. Uh, a book came out, I, don't, I forget when, sometime, somewhere in 1980 or so. Uh, but it didn't contain the entire, the entire run of the strip for some reason, and we're collecting all of it, and that'll be out next year. And that really is a masterpiece for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's just brilliant work. And uh, I also wanted to just say uh, that it's an absolute honor to be publishing Gay and Wilson. I never thought I'd be doing that. And uh, this uh, the Playboy book, which is um, we'll be out about six weeks currently, is going to be just a gorgeous three-volume slipcase edition. And I'm really, really proud of it and uh, pleased to be publishing him. Uh, does anyone have uh, maybe one last uh, question? Or? No, this is uh, yes. So what's the fate of republishing your early cartoons like in Collier's book? Oh, we'll talk to Gang about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think probably uh, <clears throat> they're, uh, I, doubt, I doubt very much that there'll be any market for them. It's, a, it's an interesting thought, though. Uh, it's a thought. Gann did a tremendous number of cartoons for Fantastic and Amazing in the 1950s and 60s that um, we'd be interested in. Oh, fantasy and science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, fantasy and yeah. science fiction. Yeah, that was a, that was a association. Yeah. Yeah. It's printed on lousy paper. <laughs> oh, was it ever. So, so as a last uh, question, Gann, um, would you like to tell the audience a little about your uh, dinner with Orson Welles? <laughs> Which dinner with Orson Welles? <laughs>
The first one. The first one. Uh, yeah, give me a little clue on that. <laughs> it was at the uh, Todd School. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Gayon sure. went to uh, attend the Todd School in Illinois, right. I think, in uh, high school. Yeah. And uh, that was also the uh, alma mater of Orson Welles 20 right. years previously. And Orson Welles would occasionally come back periodically and have dinner with the students. Right. And uh, Gayon was, uh, was lucky enough to be one of those students during uh, one of those dinners. Yeah. And I remember you telling me just how, uh, how thrilling it was to have dinner with Orson Welles and oh. listen to him. Oh, well, let's see. Well, I can't think of some specific dinner. I mean, he, yeah, that was a great setup. It was a, uh, uh, I would had, it was <clears throat> back in, uh, I was in, uh, uh, now we were living in Evanston, Illinois, and um, the Evanston Township High School, the uh, top part of it became a, one of the great starting places for progressive education. And uh, it was a, mar a very well-intentioned uh, notion which was that the kids should be more involved in the creation of the, of the, uh, of the curriculum. Uh, and uh, so the, what they would do uh, was, uh, I, I got, I was, the teachers would, got a bunch of us there, sort of asking would you, be, would you participate in this experiment, and because we were very flattered, and so, sure, of course we would. And, uh, it, they, the, uh, the, the teacher would ask these students to consider and then vote on a, a core subject, as they call it, C-O-R-E, subject. And, uh, and then uh, you, we would all make little reports on aspects of this core subject. So I and a little bunch of uh, other rascals, uh, when well, we heard this, got together in the hallway, and we said, well, why don't we uh, think up some uh, topic that uh, we've already got down, so that we can just do a report of what we know about it already. I mean, uh, and so we did just that. We worked out a thing where <coughs> we would push for, politically, subject X, under which we all had, a certain, we could just step right up to the rostrum and, and give this report for not doing any work at all. And uh, we got away with it. And the other students had no idea we were doing this, nor did the teacher. And it fu at first it was kind of fun just not to have to do anything in school except <laughs> blather. Uh, but uh, after a while I realized I wasn't learning anything. <laughs> and I mean, geez, I'd come out of this place and a jerk, totally. I mean, completely uninformed. So, I told my parents this is uh, what the situation was, and they said, oh my God, well, then. all right. So they very sweetly started searching for a school, and they, uh, this representative from a place called Todd School, which is in upstate uh, Illinois, <coughs> a place called, a town called Woodstock, which is, uh, uh, which was the locale, by the way, of this uh, uh, wonderful movie where the guy is Wednesday, and, and the, the, the he has this Wednesday, and he relives the Wednesday, and he can play with Groundhog him. Day? Yeah, Groundhog Day. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a sort of Americana uh, town. It's fantastically Americana, and uh, quite, quite lovely. Uh, and in this, the school was uh, run by a guy who was a genius. He was Roger Hill, is his name. And uh, he had inherited this, this thing from his father. And... Uh, <coughs> He, uh, he was a Shakespearean scholar par excellence, and he, he was just one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. And uh, he, was, uh, he had, uh, was responsible for, uh, Orson Welles was, uh, he was his uh, sort of his advisor. And for example, I mean, in, in, in his place, his refuge, his, his, he depended on uh, 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 Hill to all the, it was just it was never public, but that was the thing. And I remember one one of the, the most famous thing in, in, with in our little world there was that when uh, Wells did the War of the Worlds radio broadcast, which starts out as a uh, uh, sort of re very highly realistic reportage thing, and this reporter saying these these news bulletins, but it's, just, it's got this ordinary show going on, it gets interrupted by news bulletins, and then the news bulletins are about this strange thing which happened in New Jersey, this, lights, this thing has come out of 
the sky and exploded and it builds up and it turns out the, the Martians are coming, the Martians are coming and it worked. Uh, Wells had no idea <laughs> it would and there was this huge panic and people actually fled uh, the state. <laughs> And he, so his, his reaction was to call, call uh, Hill, who to which he, his nickname was the, the Skipper, and he said, Skipper, Skipper, they want to kill me, they want to kill me. <laughs> but uh, the, the touching thing was that Wells, um, his, he, he, had, he had a very tough time, he was, he was this maverick, and uh, he never really uh, fit in, and he's always having a trouble with the, because uh, he was, the, the, high school, the, the, the Hollywood people just it, it was, there was always a lot of conflict there and uh, so it was, it was very hard uh, but he was, so he had this refuge his fantasy which was quite touch very sweet uh, was that someday he was going to quit show business and he'd teach at Todd uh, and, and he meant it he really did and he would come t to Todd uh, periodically and spend a little time there uh, and uh, and he was great. <laughs> he was, uh, and he did. He'd he'd, he'd uh, wander around the campus looking like a, a teacher, you know, and so on, <laughs> playing a teacher. And he would. We, we had these this dining hall which had these tables, and he'd sit at various tables. And I'm telling you, having lunch with Orson Welles was one hell of an experience. Uh, and he'd just ramble on, say all these wonderful things. And uh, you'd ask him questions, and he'd come up with these wonderful answers, and so on. And um, actually, he did a thing called uh, The Stranger. I don't know if you have seen that one, and which is about uh, Todd's school. And they had all kinds of stuff like uh, he, he made it as much like Todd's school as possible. And he had uh, Skipper and the other people in the school in the movie, not them, but actors acting as much like it as possible. And it was it was. Uh, it was really, really beautiful, and it was, uh, and it was marvelous to, uh, uh, as as a as a kid, to be um, have a have a uh, kind of regular con uh, uh, contact with someone of that incredible quality and and uh, reach. It really was. I think. And I think that was uh, huge. Huge in my life, and uh, and and probably in most of the kids that, uh, that that were lucky enough to go through with the same thing. It's astonishing. Thank you. I think with that anecdote, we have to wrap it up.